Shabbat Shalom. Hi, Shabbat Shalom everyone, Lunar Shabbat Shalom. It is Kislev 15, full moon, Lunar Shabbat, full illumination, full power, full anointing. Shabbat Shalom. Today's Torah portion is uh, Vayetzi. It means he went out or to go. Key phrase is to go or went out. And it begins at Genesis chapter 28, verse 10, and goes all the way to chapter 32, um, verse 3. 28, Genesis 28, 10 to Genesis 32, verse 3. He went out is the meaning of Vayetzi. The word Vayetzi is, and he went out, or to go, to leave something, to depart, to begin a journey of some kind, uh, and forsaking uh, something else for the new thing, or whatever. He went out to go. But before we get started, uh, we're commanded to blow the holy shofar. We know that the holy shofar, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, is the voice of God. And our forefathers were commanded to blow the holy shofar before they went into battle to ensure themselves of the victory. We know that the walls of Jericho came down after they blew the holy shofar, after the, the Kohanim blew the shofar. The walls just came down. So when we blow this shofar, the demonic world thinks it's the voice of Yeshua. And they flee. They get back. And holy angels, you know, rush in. Any, any slow demons, the holy angels rush in, detain them, break them down, kick them out. And then we enthrone with the last blast of the shofar, we enthrone the very presence of Yahweh in this room. And not only do they flee from this place, they're going to flee from where you are. And they're going to flee from what their positions in you or their positions opposing you at least four times. You know that the Bible says they, they depart four times. But right now, as the word goes forth, they're going to get out of here. They're not going to be able to hinder this word. Amen? Amen. Okay. We're going to blow the ram's horn today instead of the Yemenite. Baruch Atah, Yahweh, Eloheinu Melech, Ho'olam, Asher, Kitsunu, Omistatah, Vitzivanu, Al Misfa, Shofa, Vishim Yeshua, Amin. been a while since I blew this one. I just want to make sure nothing's in there to crawl in my mouth. <laughs> Scatter your enemies, O Lord. Yahweh, Eloheinu, Melech, Ho'olam, Asher, Kitsunu, Bovisata, 
this is final. Our mitzvah. Seat seat. Do you send me sure? I mean. Barukata, Yahweh. Eloheinu, Malek, Horam. Asher, Kitsunu, Bomisvata, Visivanu, Al Misva, Urim, Thurim, Vishim Yeshua, Ami. This pouch that I have around my neck contains what is believed to be by some scholars the 12 stones or crystals that were in the breastplate of the high priest whenever he went into the holy chamber. We don't know exactly which stones were in the breast, the breastplate because over time, different people in different areas of the world and at different times called the same stones by different names. So we don't, you know, even though the Bible uh, names the stones, we don't know if what the Bible is calling, say, an onyx, uh, is the same thing that we call an onyx today. Although I do believe that uh, in studying the properties of the onyx stone, that the Bible and what we call an onyx today are the same. But we can't, I don't have that type of definitive uh, proof for all, you know, the rest of the eleven. Okay, and as we be, you know, I, I used to try to wear this every time I preached or taught. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get back to it, um, you know, after the pandemic. It, it's taken time to reclaim my old anointing. You know, you might can hear uh, a rumble in my voice. You know, I, I can certainly feel it like I got gravel in my throat. Uh, today, so pray for the complete healing of my vocal cords for me. Join me in that as I come back and everything. I really don't want an operation to restore that to exactly the way it was. <clears throat> but, you know, some of you know when I first came out of the hospital, I couldn't talk at all. So um, my right vocal cord was paralyzed from COVID. That is good. Your point is good. Amen. And they say now it is moving again, but it's not. Uh, the left one, you know, has a complete range of motion, and the right one is moving, but not as much as it was before the pandemic. They're supposed to be able to move and touch each other completely. So my right one is only partially moving to make contact. And so you hear I'm sounding like Froggy or the Little Rascals a little bit. Yeah, you sound good. Well, I feel it. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel the same. I can feel a different vibration. You feel it kind of. Yeah, in my throat. It may sound okay, but I feel a different vibration than what I used to. It's not as smooth, you know. People who really work on cars, you know, uh, who really love cars, you know, they listen to the engine and they say, oh, it just don't quite sound right. You know, don't have that right vibration, you know. But anyway, let's get to today's Torah portion. Uh, Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. I'm going to read a couple of different uh, translations. Uh, Sister Leslie is going to read the King James translation for you now. Um, go ahead. Right now, sir? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Sure. Nice and loud. Okay, let me get it over here. Okay. Here. Mm -hmm. So, King James Version, kind of like in what Habada Org Version was, but I'll read this. Okay, read Habada Org too. Go ahead and read King James. The whole thing from Genesis? Just 2810. Yeah, 2810 to. Verse 10. Just that one verse? Just verse oh. 10. Yeah. Okay. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Say that again. Read and that. Jacob went out from Beersheba. Vayetzi went out. Vayetzi. And Jacob went out. Go ahead. That's right. When that means Vayetzi. Okay. From Beersheba and went toward Haran. And went toward 
Padan Aram, some versions, okay. Uh, I'm reading from the Kabbalistic Bible, Bible, and it says, And Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. Um, another rabbinical translation. I'm going to put on my glasses and stop perpetrating here. Okay. And Jacob left Beersheba and he went. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hold on. This thing is a little funny. And he went to Let's see. Wait a minute. And he went. That's not it. Okay. And Jacob left Bersheba and he went. Vayetzi and is and Jacob left. And I'm trying to see where it picks up in this thing. And he went to Padan Aram. Okay. This has one torsion on top and the other at the bottom. All right. Okay. That's verse 11. And he went to Aram. Okay. And Jacob left Beersheba and he went to Aram or Padan Aram. What does Chabad.org, how do they... Well, I thought you were going to go for more than that, but it's the next verse that I thought was interesting, the way they said it. But uh, the same as that, it says, And Jacob left Beersheba, and he went to Haran. Okay. Go ahead. You said you find verse 11 interesting how it said. Read it. I like it better than what I said. It's interesting. And he arrived at the place and lodged there, because the sun had set. And he took some of the stones of the place and placed them at his head, and he lay down in that place. Placed them at his head. Yes. Read King James. Okay. This is this is, the, this is the, the translation that I grew up on, the one that confused the heck out of me. Go okay. ahead and read King James. And he lighted upon a certain place. And tarried there all night, mm -hmm. because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place, and put them for his pillows. Okay. And laid down in that place to sleep. Now, I, reading that, I would say, gosh, why would anyone use stones for a pillow? <laughs> okay. Okay. What is that? You know, using stones for a pill. It seemed like you would just take your your backpack or your bedroll or whatever, roll it up and put it up under your head and go to sleep. Why in the world would you take stones for your pill? Pillow. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And in the translation on um, Habad.org, read that one again. About that one. It says, and he arrived at the place and lodged there because the sun had set. And he took some of the stones of the place and placed them at his head, and he lay down in that place. Interesting. Habad.org says he placed them at his head. Yeah, at his head. It doesn't say what King James says. Placed them for his pillow. pillows. Right, that he took it for now, his pillows. Now, the Kabbalistic Bible does the same thing that King James did on verse 11. Okay. He reached a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Mm -hmm. And he took up the stones from there and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. That's verse 11. Now, we know that the first word or words of the Torah portion <clears throat> name that particular Torah portion. That's been known. I've known that, expressed that for years. The new revelation is that the first verse, the first word, and the first verse of the Torah portion has a revelation 
for healing of some kind. So far, my theory has, uh, I've proven it to you every week so far, uh, the past six weeks, and this, I believe, this is the seventh week, the seventh Torah portion. And I'm waiting to see if my theory will hold out through all 54 Torah portions, whether or not uh, that's going to remain true. And so far, I'm, I'm very pleased to report uh, just as well in this Torah portion as it did. Interesting. Because as you'll see, I, there's a progression. And the progression goes back to, of course, begins in Bereshit, where we are talking about creation, creating you, actually. Then in Noah, the Torah portion is talking about the perfection of your DNA, your, DNA, mm -hmm. your chromosomes. Okay? Then we had the healing of the sexual organs of Abraham after he, you know, yeah, after he was circumcised. And, and, and the message to Sarah about what was going to happen in her womb. And then we had uh, Kaya Sarah. And boy, you know, that, that one, you really need to, to go back and watch that teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, because not only does it talk about her womb, her uterus, her reproductive system, but everything that happens with that. And now we're talking about the grandson of all of that. Okay. And last week we talked about the generations of Isaac. So you can see from our creation to the perfection of our DNA, to the healing of our sexual organs, to the anointing that was on Sarah's reproductive system, to the generations or the genealogy of Isaac, his two sons. Now it says, and Jacob left Beersheba and sent out for Padam Haran or Haran. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to verse 11. You know, uh, our focus, and, and as it has been, in all the other Torah portion, it's just on the first verse. But I'm going to show you something here today about the second verse in, in this one. Mm -hmm. How the second verse is really the first verse. Or it is a description of what takes place in the first verse. Interesting, very interesting. Kind of have to go to seminary to get that one. Well, maybe not, you know, we'll see. Now, it says, And Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. The rabbis note the fact, the scripture could have just said, and Jacob went to Haran. Why does it say he left Beersheba in order to get to Haran? There is a revelation when you consider the possibilities for exegesis and interpretation of that. Why does the Bible say he left something because, you know, why do we need to know where he left? We're more interested in where he's going than we are where he, you know. The scripture is trying to convey to us here. And it is, it's coded. It doesn't really tell you what's going on. You have to meditate on the word. You have to delve into the original language. Beersheba means well of the seven oaks. 
So he left the well to go to the mountains. Haran means mountains or, or mountainous or a, a mountaineer. Mm -hmm. Left the wells to become a mountaineer or to go to the mountains. We know that Haran, when you when you look up Padan Haran, it's a mountainous region. The mountains are there. And even when you read on, it talks about the mountains that are in that area. And he, you know, he could see the mountains. Now, he left and went. Vayet. He left that behind to go to the mountains. Interesting, okay? I believe that what the word is trying to teach us here. Well, let me back up a little bit. What happened when he went to Haran? We know uh, later on in the um, in the scripture that he worked seven years for his first wife. Was his first wife uh, Leah or Rachel? I think it was it was Leah. Am I correct? You want to yeah. fact check me on that? Okay. okay. I believe it was Leah. He wanted Rachel, who was the younger sister of Leah. Um, but they tricked him, got him so drunk that he thought he was going into the tent with Rachel, but he was actually going into the tent with Leah. And he didn't, he didn't realize it until the next morning. And then he had to work another seven years in order to get Rachel. Now, at this point in Jacob's life, now he didn't know it. Yeah, you're right. Jacob uh, waited 14 years before he could be with Rachel. Okay. So he, was, yeah. he didn't know it at the time, but he was the conduit, the conduit for spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel and even the nation itself, the physical nation itself, and even the land of Israel, not to mention all of the inhabitants since then of Israel from his loins, were, you know, that all that, that whole nation was in his loins at the time. He was Israel. His name was Jacob, but he was in fact Israel. If something would have happened to Jacob, if he had died, if he had decided, well, I'm going to join the LGBTQ plus community, Israel would have never happened. God would have had to, to get a holy seed and a holy people to bless the whole world because, you know, without Jacob, right now, without Jacob, Jesus could never happen. Mm -hmm. Yeshua couldn't come forth in the flesh from the womb of the Virgin Mary. So he is everything at this point. Now remember in the Torah portion, uh, Kai Serah, it was Sarah who was the conduit at that time. And Abraham. Now, the grandson, Jacob, is the one. Isaac and Rebekah were the conduits at one point. But now their time has passed. It's gone. Now it is up 
to Jacob to go out from Beersheba to Haran. If he does not do this, everything falls apart. No Savior, no Redeemer, no one from the root of Jesse, no King David, no Mashiach, no Messiah. Jacob is all of this right now in a moment of time. Think about that. In one moment of time, he is everything that God plans to do in the earth realm. One moment of time. Can't mess with it. Or you mess up everything. You believe in a woman's right to choose? Mm -mm. You're messing with things you don't have any idea of. You have no idea what you're doing. You don't know how many nations you're killing in your womb. You don't know what plans of God are in your womb for the redemption of all mankind. And you talk about a woman's right to choose. You want to be LGBTQ plus? You don't know what the heck you're doing. They just don't. Yeah, just you don't have a clue. We're sorry, but you don't know. You don't know who you are or what you are. Before Jacob left Beersheba, he didn't know who he was. He didn't know he was Israel. He didn't know who he was or what he was or what he was what he was to become. And he would not have found out unless he left Beersheba. When we read ahead and he worked seven years for um, Leah and then he had to work another seven years for Rachel, he didn't know that was going to happen. The future of the entire world is at stake here. If he does not leave Beersheba and go to Haran, Israel does not happen. In this one verse, in this one moment of time, this critical decision to leave Beersheba behind to embrace his future and the, the future of mankind is hanging in the balance here. Oh my God. This is something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is something if you know, you, sh you should be on the edge of your seat right now. What's, what's next, Rabbi? Come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Now, Haran was in the mountains. One way that you can perceive this is that he had to leave something of a lower nature or a lower elevation to come up to Haran. That could be his consciousness. He had to, in order to fulfill his future, the level of his consciousness had to come from Beersheba, from the well, to Haran in the mountains. Amen? His consciousness had to change. It had to be ele elevated. His vibration had to change. It had to increase. He had to be elevated in his consciousness and increase his vibration in order to embrace his future. 
He had to come out of one state of mind and elevate to another state of mind. Because his future and the future of the world was in Haran. It was with Rachel and Leah. Yeah. Elevation. Mm -hmm. Elevation of consciousness. Elevation or increase in frequency. In vibration. All that had to change. You know, what this is saying, in order to embrace your future, you're going to have to leave something behind. You're going to have to elevate your consciousness. You may not leave a physical place, mm -hmm. but you have to elevate your consciousness in order to embrace your future. And sticking with our theme that the first verse or the, and the first words of, of a Torah portion the beginning of a Torah portion uh, verse, there's healing there. He had to do this so the whole world would be healed. So that's healing. So how does this pertain to us today? And what I came up with, if you are at that stage of life, where you're looking for a mate. You need to ask yourself, how come you haven't found them yet? If you're praying for a mate, it means you haven't found them yet, him or her. You have not found them yet. Yeah. Why not? It's because you're in a lower plane of existence. Your consciousness is too low. Mm. You're going to need to come up. I don't, you know, it's funny. Um, the Lord puts different things on my mind at different times. And then maybe a few weeks later, it'll be revealed why I'm thinking about that. I was telling Sister Leslie that I kind of went back in time to when I was in college you know, around age 17, 18, 19 years old. And I realized that none of the women that I knew at that time or that I would spend any appreciable amount of time with were suitable candidates for a wife, suitable candidates for marriage. Not one. If I would have taken any one of them as a wife, oh my goodness, who knows what would have happened? Well, I do. <laughs> because I did what Abraham did. Abraham's future, the elevation of his consciousness, was Sarah, who was the mother of Isaac, the father of Jacob. But what did he do? He took Hagar uh -huh. and had Ishmael. And Ishmael, like the Bible says, is going to be like a wild man all his days. And his hand will be against his neighbor all his days. That's the Arab people. And there's no other people group on earth who are like the Arabs. I'm not trying to put anybody down. But, hey, ain't nobody else walking around blowing people up with a vest, okay? Ain't nobody else crashing airplanes into skyscrapers. Nobody else on earth is doing what the Arabs do and the followers of Islam in Al-Qaeda and ISIS, Boko Haram, uh, whatever that name, Boko Haram, Boko whatever. Yeah. Nobody is doing that. And the Taliban. And the Taliban. Nobody is doing that but our Arab brothers, our Arab cousins. Like a wild man. They like wild men. All their days. Yeah. 
no hope. <clears throat> Prophecy is, and you know, unless they uh, accept Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach and cover themselves with his blood, they're going to continue. I get it. Okay. I have to interject. Okay, come on. Only because it's about the blood. Scoot up here and make sure they can hear you. It is about the blood. Blood is where the iniquities are passed down through, the generation. Absolutely. The also, life of the beast is in the blood, yeah. Also, when you think of Candace Pert's book, Molecules of Emotion, mm -hmm. it's in the blood that behavior is learned or mm -hmm. passed down. Oh, so, ooh, that's good. So you're thinking oh, yeah. about when all the beginning mm -hmm. of Abraham and Sarah and mm -hmm. Abraham being with Hagar. Mm -hmm. What did Isaac do? What happened with Isaac and his bride? Rachel. Rachel. They begot Jacob. Okay. Okay, but there was a thing about the, I don't know, um, pretending to be the sister behavior, pretending that their wife was their sister because they were. Afraid. Oh yeah, they both did it. They both Abraham, did that. Abraham did it. Isaac imitated it. Right, and then okay. another thing, and you know, you got uh, Jacob. It's almost, a, I don't know if it's just to say the same thing with Leah and the trick. I don't know, that learned behavior thing from um, Laban, who tricked, I don't know. I, I, there, is a, there is a pattern of learned behavior, so I'm trying to express the, it. I see what you're well saying. On. They all three, uh, the first two, Abraham and Isaac, lied and said that their wife was actually their sister. Their sister. Because of, out of fear. Jacob got tricked thinking that he's going in with his wife that he betrothed, was betrothed right. to, and it was actually her sister. All yeah. three kind of right. have the same... Things going back, passing down over and over again. Yeah. God sees all of this. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm just seeing the be learned behavior that's coming through the blood. And therefore, like you said, when you have... The Arab brother. Abraham caused the curse to come on him right. when he did that. They got passed down to Isaac, and now Jacob yeah. is living out that the curse is. when he yeah. gets tricked. Right. Yeah, very good. Very good. Very good. Okay, and now Thanks the blood of Yeshua is the only blood that takes away it that curse. That. Yeah. It stops it. Amen. So, Abraham, Arab brothers, just receive Yeshua. And many are, but not enough. <laughs> they all need to see it. So, okay. You know, this is not written down, people. This is all by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay? You know, I'm not reading any notes here. I, you know, I didn't write all this down. Okay? Very mm -hmm. good. Very good. Very, very good. That's that's an interesting... And there's so much more you can go into when you talk about Leah and her sons, and Rachel and her sons, the difference, why Joseph becomes the firstborn of Rachel, Rachel and, um, J um, you know... First sons, and he's the leader of. That's Joseph. Right, becomes the leader, and okay. the reason why Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, from Leah, because Leah despised uh, Rachel when she was. They both hated each other because Leah knew that Jacob. Well, Leah was in love, so she. Yeah. She God gave her a child first, but, and Reuben. Yeah. Anyway, okay. there's a lot to say in there. Well, so Reuben. Betrayed his father by sleeping with one of his wives. Yeah, that's okay. what's going on with all of their children, and why Leah had, you know, and Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin. And we would have to go love. from this one verse. Well, you know, sister, well, sister Leslie, you know, all that's in this one verse, all of that, okay, and we would have to go back and look at. You know, all of Jacob's wives, yep. all of his sons, their position. I've got it written out here. Leah, having Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishakar, and Zebulun, and Dinah. But out of the sons, Zebulun. Rachel has Joseph and Benjamin. Then there's Bilhah, Rachel's concubine. And with Jacob, they have Dan and Naphtali. And then Leah's concubine, Zilpha. Jacob and Zilpha have Gad and Asher. Who had who had Judah? Um, it was uh, Leah. Leah had Judah. Leah had Judah, but Joseph, Rachel had Joseph. Okay, yeah. 
So I'm like, what do you know about that? And so Judah moved first. Judah moved Judah first. Judah had the, the first position. But Joseph was leader of all, all of Israel. Okay. Well, over over Egypt. Egypt, yeah. Over Egypt. And, 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 the and tribes it was through there. him that um, the 12 tribes were saved. Yeah. Now, um, Leah, his first wife, she had Judah. His first wife had Judah, which was the first position. Okay. So Reuben was first, and I'm Simeon, because Reuben means see a But son. she still had, she, but Judah has yeah. the first position. She yeah, had Reuben, Reuben. Reuben the first position. but he was kicked down because he and uh, um, Levi uh, destroyed that uh, group of people, deceived them, yeah. and everything. He was too ruthless, plus he um, had sex with one of uh, Jacob's wives. Uh, okay, who did Leah have again? Leah had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishikar, and Zebulun. Okay. Zebulun and Ishikar and Judah had the first positions. Mm -hmm. They were on the east. Their campment was on the east, those three. And Judah moves first. Mm -hmm. Ishikar, they were like the prophets. They knew the times and the time. Yeah. Okay. Zebulun, they were the businessmen. They financed the movement. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ishikar told them what to do and when to do it. Zebulun came up with the money to do it. And then Judah moved first. Okay. Okay. So they had the first position and they were the sons of the first wife. So they had the first position position Very good. okay and then Levi because he was so ruthless with Reuben he didn't even get a portion but he was the first and the only you know to go into the the holy place okay 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 so you can the position of the wives dictated the position of the tribes it seems Mm -hmm. I haven't studied this out, so, but you can see yeah. where, I, where I'm going yeah. with that, okay? Now, getting back to um, verse 10, you have to, you know, Jacob was not only on a physical journey that required elevation, he was also on a spiritual journey that required elevation. And as I was saying, if you're praying for a husband, why are you praying for a husband? Because you haven't found one yet. Why haven't you found one yet? Or why haven't your husband found you yet? Time? Timing maybe? Or maybe you're in Beersheba and you need to hurry up and get to Haran. Your husband will find you in Haran. He's not going to find you at the disco, at the club. He should find you at the church, at the synagogue, at the temple. Yeah. You know, are you at the church, but your mind is still in the club? Mm, yeah. Looking for a husband? Okay? Yeah. So the healing here, and this is only one part, there's about two or three different things here that, that are healed. You should meditate on, in Hebrew on this scripture in Hebrew if you're looking for a husband, if you're trying to heal your future and the future of your children's children's children. You meditate on this scripture. It will have an effect on your DNA. So if you have any type of hereditary disorder or disease, could be diabetes. Diabetes, they say, is hereditary. A lot of different things they say are passed down. You should meditate on this scripture as well as the ones that came before you know, it's like you're going through different stages. You know, you really need to go back 
and listen to my tour portion uh, starting with Bear Sheep. Or, and, and really, be honest, you should go all the way back to Rosh Hashanah and then Yom Kippur and then especially Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Torah portions so that you can get the full picture, this cycle that began back on Rosh Kadesh, on Rosh Hashanah, Tishri 1, we're progressing. We're progressing. You're elevating. Mm -hmm. But to meditate on this scripture, now you're starting to get more and more into your prodigy, into your, your DNA of your generations, spiritually and physically. Your consciousness is elevating. Remember, um, yeah. we talked about Abraham calling himself helping God out by taking Hagar and, you know, and begotten Ishmael, which turns out, you know, it's been a disaster from the beginning even to today. And it's going to continue to be a disaster unless the Arab world and the Islamic world accept Moshiach yes. as Adonai. Amen. Yeshua as Adonai. Amen. Pray for it's going to continue. Pray, pray, pray. It's not going to stop. You, you, can have a, you can have a ton of peace accords. You can sit up the Gaza Strip. You can sit up the West Bank. But until they accept Yeshua, until you drive out the inhabitants, they shouldn't be on the Gaza Strip. They shouldn't be in the West Bank. The words said they're going to be like a spike in, a, like a thorn in your eye. Yeah. And that's exactly what they are. But it's another topic. In my first marriage, I didn't marry the woman God told me to marry. That was all me. That was all me doing that. And I have one older daughter. And one child from that union. And it's difficult. Our relationship is, um, is troubled. Because God did not tell me to marry her mother. But there's nothing you can do about that now. As much as I can get her to accept the blood of Yeshua the more healing will come in our relationship. The more of the word she rejects, the worse our relationship gets. The more of the word and the blood that she accepts, the better our relationship is. Absolutely. Everybody, okay? anybody, everybody has to do that. Now, I raised her. I, I put the seed of the word in it. And... When she responds to the word, our relationship is great. When she responds to her mother, our relationship uh, dissolves, literally. Okay? But that's my fault. I did, you know, that, that was me doing it. What do you mean? I decided I was going to get married. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask God anything about it. Okay. I didn't pray and ask him for a wife. I just decided I'm going to do this. Period. Okay. Period. End of story. Something I did. God went in. We got married in the judge's chambers. Didn't get married in the church. Didn't have a man of God. Uh, an ordained man of God, representative of God in the church here on earth, performed the ceremony. I was a member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. Her father was my frat brother. Okay. 
Her mother was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha, an AKA. She was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha, an AKA. And I thought that was sufficient for bloodline, mm -hmm. for destiny. An Omega man and a AKA getting married. My bloodline was not being established upon the, the plans and purposes of God. It was the world. You know, yeah. it was all worldly. You know, that's, you know, that's real good networking. Mm -hmm. An Omega and an AKA. Okay? Worldly. Really, yeah. you know, very good networking. Socializing. Mm. Okay? Not necessarily, I'm not saying that there are some very successful unions between members of fraternities and sororities. But they, they have to be based on the word of God. I had a different destiny that I didn't know about. I didn't know what my destiny in God was. I was doing everything worldly. I was completely worldly. Just like I started to say earlier, in those days, I did not know one woman who would be a suitable wife for me. And I was so, when I realized I was so ashamed, I said, oh God, you know, I was really repentant. I, I was totally in an environment that was ungodly. Totally. Imagine, you know, you wake up and you say, I'm in an environment that's completely ungodly. There is not one person here who is a suitable candidate for marriage. That's a desperate place to find yourself in. And that's where Jacob was when he was in Beersheba. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. There were no suitable candidates for marriage. That's part of the reason he left. One, he had just tricked his brother Esau, and Esau was, you know, wanting to kill him. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that shows you the difference between the two, Esau immediately went to Ishmael and took a wife of the Canaanites, which is what Isaac told them not to do. Just as Abraham went someplace else to find a wife for Isaac because Canaanite women were not suitable. Nope. Nobody went. <laughs> you know, yeah. sorority girls are not suitable candidates for marriage in and of themselves. You know, it, just that alone is not enough. Yeah, you'll look good as a couple on campus. You wearing your frat sweater. She's wearing her sorority sweater. And you're strolling down the line. Everybody on campus wants to be you. Every guy wants to be you. Wearing your frat, you know, your frat sweater, your frat jacket. Yeah. With a pretty little sorority girl wearing her colors. <laughs> All the girls want to be her. Okay? Mm -hmm. Y'all looking good. But that's not that's not suitable material for marriage or conditions and circumstances. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a fraternity guy marrying a sorority girl, but there's got to be more to it than that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my mother told me one thing when I was talking about marrying my first wife and I said oh her father is this her mother is that and my mother said to me you're not marrying her father you're not marrying her mother that's all she said now I understand okay yeah. now I understand yeah
Isaac and Rebe Rebecca told Jacob he's got to go. This is not a suitable environment to pick a woman from. Your brother has gone and done that. The bloodline through him, mm -mm, no. Plus, Esau wanted to kill him, so he, hmm. <laughs> so he told him to go, you know, to Iran, Iran to find a wife. Elevation. This morning I was thinking about, I said, what had, you know, he began his spiritual journey by leaving Beersheba. Then in Haran, that was the first, like, Haran, then in Haran, he really began his spiritual journey. First by marrying Leah, then by marrying Rachel. And then it came time for him to leave that, his spiritual journey, the next leg of his spiritual journey. And I thought about my life or the life of me and Leslie, Sister Leslie, yeah. the Navia. Mm -hmm. We met in Stanford, Connecticut at church. We were both Seeking working God. in the church and teaching at church. Okay? Just as Jacob had a blood connection with Rachel and, Lee, and Leah. There was a connection for them to come together. There would have been no connection if he would have taken a Canaanite woman. Now let me tell you something about the Canaanites. Why couldn't he marry a Canaanite? Canaanite women were the equivalent of that time of porn stars. I'm not making that up. I'm not exaggerating. They were the equivalent of porn stars. Their sexual practices would make a maggot gag. Ooh, that is rough. Where did you get that? <laughs> make a maggot gag. That's um. Just, yeah, the sexual practices could gag a maggot. <laughs> Bestiality, yep. homosexuality, LGBTQ+, plus, sacrificing their, force, their firstborn children, all of that. All of that. Mm. They called it sacred prostitution. They worshipped their pantheon of gods by various sexual practices. Men with men, women with women, men and women with animals. Mother and son, mother and daughter, father and son, father and daughter. Different sexual practices were used to worship different gods. They would get together and engage in various sexual practices in order to worship their pantheon of gods. All of, like I said, just everything from A to Z. Everything from A, everything from A to Z. There was one God, when he was born, a rival God blocked the birth passage through the vagina. And this particular God had to be born through the anus. So to worship that God, yeah. guess what they did? Anal sex. Yeah, that's, that's, <coughs> that's something else. Come on. Just truth. <clears throat> that's why he couldn't marry a Canaanite woman that's why his, imagine growing up and he grew up seeing all this mm -hmm. that was all around him 
This is the environment that he grew up in. This is the environment that he saw. <coughs> that was his consciousness. His consciousness had to be elevated out of there. He had to leave physically. He had to leave it mentally. And of course he had to come out of that spiritually. He had to remember the lessons that Isaac and Rebecca taught him, and you know, at, in the in the house, in the home, and not the lessons he was learning from the you know the people around him. Mm -hmm. When it came time, we had to leave that and go to Haran. But in my spiritual journey, like I said, I met Sister Leslie in church. We were both um, teachers at the church in different programs. So we had that spiritual connection. And I looked this up this morning and I was really surprised. That was, you know, I was, I was working in New York. I used to take the train in from Stanford, Connecticut into Manhattan, and, you know, to my office. The elevation of Stanford, Connecticut is about 23 feet above sea level. We married, we moved to Baton Rouge. The elevation of Baton Rouge is about 56 feet above sea level. You know, the Lord, you know, did it this way because he knew I was going to be teaching this Torah portion 28 years ago, and I would see these connections, these synchronicities. Okay. Yes. So we went to we went from an elevation of twenty three feet above sea level to an elevation of about fifty six feet above sea level. D double. Spiritually That's really really Stafford is a lower elevation than Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. Baton Rouge got You think it would be. Yeah. But it isn't. Wow. So Spiritually, when we went to Baton Rouge, we increased. We learned, she learned a lot more about the word while we were there. I learned a lot more. I received my calling to go into the ministry while I was there. Mm -hmm. Then from Baton Rouge, we moved to Tulsa. Tulsa is about, is, Tulsa is over 600 feet above sea level. Elevation. And we really learned a lot. Yes. In Tulsa, I was in seminary, you know, that was really a wonderful spiritual environment. Yes. Our children, uh, you know, were born there, raised there, went to school there, went to church there. Very spiritual environment there very in Tulsa. Nice. Very, very, nice. very good environment um, for raising children. It's changing somewhat. It's, it's not as good as it used to be today, but considerably better. Then we, from Tulsa, we moved to Colorado, to the Denver area. We're 5,000 feet above sea level now. Now we're attacking. We have the high ground. You know, one thing that you want if you're in the battle you always want the high ground. Mm -hmm. Now we have the high ground. Mm -hmm. And we're really ramping up our ministry. We're really starting it up. Because we have the high ground now. We're 5,000 feet above sea level. Our vision is to buy a place in the mountains where we will have our church, our retreat, our clinic, where people can come and actually stay on the premises while we pray for them and treat them for their healing, whether it's a physical ailment, emotional, or spiritual, free of charge. And we and when we do that, we will go to a, when we buy that place, we will be at an even higher 
elevation. Amen. Yes, you will. I like that. That's, you know, that's, and that's amen. The Holy Spirit showed me that this morning. I said, hmm, okay. My spiritual journey. How the places we move to keep, ele you know, the elevation keeps increasing. Mm -hmm. From where we were married to where we are now. And even where we would like to be. Wow. Yeah, wow. Okay. Cool. If you want to find a mate, if you want to optimize your DNA, meditate on this first verse in Hebrew. So we're still dealing with the perfection of our genes here. From Genesis all the way to Vayetzi is about DNA, our sexual organs, and the perfection of our DNA. And finally, finding someone who can match our elevation and the higher frequency that we operate, a higher vibration, as they say, that we operate on that you operate on. Because if you meet someone who's on a lower vibration than you are, the two of you can't really get together. That's not going to last. A lower vibration is either you got to come down. If you're going to be with that person, you either got to come down or they got to come up. Hmm. It's always better to go up. It's always better to leave Beersheba and go to Haran than to stay in Beersheba or be in Haran and backtrack and go down to Beersheba. Yeah, very, very interesting. So this scripture is healing, but it's healing throughout your future generations and finding the right mate. It's about healing your entire life and the life of your children's 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 children. It's about passing on a blessing physically, spiritually, and emotionally down your bloodline. If you want that to happen, this is the scripture. Vayetzi. Come out. Go up. Very good. Now that's just the first healing. Hmm. Okay? That's just the first. Let's look at verse 11. He reached a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. And he took of the stones from that place. It says from there. Of a translation says he reached a place. Okay. And put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Now, when I first got the revelation on this scripture several years ago, I was wondering, why would he take stones for his pillows? And I was reading rabbinical commentary, not the Christian commentators, but the rabbinical commentary, and they said that pillows mm -hmm. is actually... Uh, was called a euphemism. Um, what's the other word that I'm looking for? Euphemism or metaphor for taking crystals and making a grid or doing a layout okay. around your head. I said, oh, this, this scripture is referring to um, the use of crystals. And I was I was really shocked, you know, because pillows, you know, took the stones for pillows. It really, is very much you. It's just like the phrase. I want to remember that. What is that called? The, oh. I'm trying to help. I can't think. Of. The phrase he kicked the bucket. Uh -huh. 
What is that called? A euphemism or is something is something else? Give me the definition of a euphemism. <laughs> I want to use the correct right. terminology here. But anyway, right. colloquialism, I got it. Okay. That's a colloquialism. Okay. It means something else. It doesn't mean exactly what it says. Kick the bucket doesn't mean you actually go and kick a bucket. Right. We all know what that means. It means you die. Bought the farm doesn't mean you go out and buy an agricultural concern. It means you die. These are colloquialisms okay. that mean something else. Pillows for your head means that you take crystals stone or stones for, for pillows for your head means you take crystals and you put them in some kind of array around your head. This is a practice that people who know about crystals will do in order to 